So hello to another Sprues and Brews video. Today we're joined by a super special guest, Patrick Murphy from Cubicle 7, talking about their upcoming Warhammer 40,000 role-playing game, Imperium Maledictum. Thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. No worries. Anytime. Always exciting to have uh, Cubicle 7 on to talk about some exciting new releases. So before we talk about Imperium Maledictum, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what Cubicle 7 do? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, Cubicle Seven are a uh, we're a games company. We we are very we're very invested in narrative experiences, um, as we refer to it. But for the most part, that means we do role playing games, and mm. um, we've also done some card games and board games in the past. Um, and we have a, a, a good amount of um, virtual tabletop support these days as well on the Foundry and Roll Twenty. Um, so we do three different um, Warhammer games uh, at the moment. Uh, we do Wrath and Glory, which is another Warmer 40,000 game. We do um, Soulbound, Age of Sigmar Soulbound, which is set in the Age of Sigmar, of course. And we do Warmer Fantasy Roleplay, which we do, we're doing the fourth edition of Warmer Fantasy Roleplay, um, which is set in the old world. Um, and we also do um, many other games. We do Doctor Who. We've got some of our own um, sort of fresh topics coming out shortly, which is uh, Victoriana, which is a sort of Victorian steampunk game. Nice. We'll be getting an update soon. Um, we've got Broken Weave, which uh, is a sort of a, a dark fantasy with a sprinkling of hope sort of game, which is going to Kickstarter soon, um, and many other plans in, 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 in the works that I, I couldn't possibly list them all. It would take too long. Amazing. It seems like an exciting time for role-playing games at the minute. Uh, I guess lockdowns maybe uh, brought more people together virtually to play games then. Uh, definitely it has. Um, I mean, the Foundry was something that we were, the support was already coming there from the community. So we were really lucky to be in a position to hop in and put a big official stamp on it and everything else, um, which I think has meant that it's like way more sustainable. So we, we have, we work really closely with um, uh, Mooman, it's his Discord handle, <laughs> to uh, get things on there for Warmer Fantasy Roleplay, uh, especially, but also for Wrath and Glory and Soulbound. Um, awesome. And we have some support in Roll20 that we'd like to expand it. Um, if we could, but we haven't uh, been able to establish like quite as good a relationship with somebody who's, you know, going to be able to develop for us in house. So uh, you know that we're still we're still looking around for that, um, right. possibly because Roll Twenty, uh, everyone wants to be on there, but um, it's harder to pin someone down. But uh, yeah, the, the the pandemic did a lot to um, bring people together online uh, for all its many many problems. At least that was something. A silver lining. <laughs> yeah, you have to look for it, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. So, so obviously we've got Imperium Maledictum coming as the big, big new Warhammer 40,000 role-playing game. We've had a number of different role-playing games set in the Warhammer 40,000 universe over the years. Have you yeah. taken any inspiration from you know what's come before, maybe in the past? Uh, well, we definitely have done, um, though we're trying to forge our own path as well. Um, something that we've seen in the past um, was that you get quite a broad you know, a breadth of different games um, focusing on like the Inquisition, focusing on the Guard, um, focusing on Space Marines or, you know, a specific uh, chapter in the sense of the De Death Watch or whatever. But um, we wanted to do something that uh, was a little different, but also had room to bring all of those um, different sort of topics in if we wanted to. So um, Imperial Maledictum in, in some ways is sort of like the hub that we can build many different spokes off of. Um, so it, it's sort of a platform for telling a lot of different stories, but the the core, the, the base game probably draws more from Warhammer Fantasy roleplay than from okay. anything else um, at the moment in terms of its its system and, and a little bit, quite a bit of its feel, I would say as well. Awesome. Well, that segues quite nicely into the next question. So obviously Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is D100 based. What's the kind of mechanics of Imperium Maledictum? Will players of Fantasy Roleplay be familiar with how the game works then? Yeah, it's D100 based as well. Um, they'll be relatively familiar with it. We use the, uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay as like a major building block for um, Imperium Maledictum. Um, there have been some changes. Um, we learned some sort of lessons along the way. There was also some considerations for the fact that like, as you know, so uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay you, is probably melee first sort of combat situation, which ranged combat is something that happens um, in support of that. And a lot of Warhammer 40,000 groups will take exactly the opposite approach because obviously you can grab a couple of chain swords and absolutely go to town 
Um, but there's an awful lot of very powerful firearms in mm. um, more forty in, in in forty k, and uh, you know we wanted combat to be sort of fulfilling and survivable uh, with with all of that around. So we we played with some ideas and and some things about like how opposed tests work, for example. Um, you, you you generally can't oppose as many ranged attacks as you did oppose melee attacks in in uh, more of a fantasy roleplay, which speeds things along a little bit. Um, okay. you know, you're, you're not counting as many success levels and comparing, but pe- people should find it familiar. Um, some things we reworked completely, like the psychic power system is is a good few miles away from the um, the magic system, say in um, more of a fantasy role play, like as it should be because they're two different things, but there's comparisons there. Um, but yeah, I, I think people are going to enjoy it. I think the, one of the main notes we took from it was a sort of a grounded. Um, you're, you're not playing a Space Marine in Imperial Maledictum. The yeah. system could certainly support it, and we may even add options for that like down the line in one of those sort of spoke books that we add. Um, but from, from the get-go, you're like a, an, an average or slightly above average sort of Imperial citizen being plucked out of your familiar role to serve powers of Mm, questionable intent sometimes mm, I bet no that sounds exciting that sounds really cool so so can you tell us a little bit about the initial kind of setting and scope then of Imperium Maledictum yeah so um well so let's touch on setting first so it's set in the Macarian sector um which is the sector that was forged out of sort of the majority of um Lord Sword Macarius's conquests during mm. the Macarian crusade which was is about 500 five centuries ish before the um the start date mm. uh so you know i'm sure anyone familiar with the lore because it's quite old lore but it's we love it anyway and i, I think other people do as well yeah. but it was one of the last great um outward expansions the imperium ever did um because it had been ten thousand years of everything slowly getting worse more or less for the imperium after the emperor uh ended up on the golden throne but um lord solar macarius didn't just like reconquer old stars he conquered new stars and new worlds um for the imperium um so they said like a thousand worlds um we, there's about 700 systems we think in the macarian sector and um, though the, the administratum are very cagey and struggle with this kind of thing um but around that um and the macarian sector it went through the uh, essentially a sort of macarian heresy after the conquest was done macarius died his generals couldn't agree on who was going to run things um, and there was, I think, a good 70 years of uh, warfare and um, horrendous, you know, uh, abominable crimes and atrocities and the like before things sort of settled down. So nothing in the Imperium is ever cut and dry. You know, there is no, it was conquered and everything was great. It was like, it was conquered. Everything was terrible for 70 years. <laughs> you know, it's been about more than four centuries from then, but a lot of those wounds still linger. Um, yeah. And now you've had... The Noctis Eterna, the coming of the Cicatrix Maledictum, you know, the the, the general everything is really bad now. Um, how, <laughs> well, how are we handling On a scale that? of bad to really bad, yeah, it's uh, not much good going on in the Imperium, is there? No, you can't have that scale. You can't have a 1 to 10 because, you know, someone will always turn up to, to turn up to 11. So you just have to say, <laughs> just, go, just worse. Everything was bad and then it got worse. Amazing. That's um, cool. Yeah, so the sector is that's the the setting, um, and we we give like a quite a chunky sort of um, introduction to the Imperium at large, and then we give another chapter that's like here's the Macarian sector, here's several worlds, different little power struggles, lots of plot hooks for GMs to to build on, um, and the focus really is a, like it's it's a very investigative sort of game. Um, you know, you're expected to root out cults and um, you know heretics and the like inside the Imperium. Um, or maybe you are those people, uh, but it, it's very Imperium focused. So, yeah. you know, there's a little bit of Xenos stuff going on, Gene Steer cults and the like, but it's it's a different style of game to say Wrath and Glory, which I think is the obvious comparison being our other Warhammer 40,000 game. Um, but yeah, this, so the scope is pretty big. Um, I mean, uh, Wrath and Glory, it takes place in, in a single system and that's like extremely fleshed out and very cool. Uh, but this takes place over a whole sector. So, you know, you, you will be, potentially traveling around quite a lot to different worlds. Um, though you could tell a compelling story just on one world or even just in one hive, I think. 
That's really cool. So you mentioned earlier about, you know, players not being space marines, at least not initially. And in Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, we see people take the mantle of just an everyday person grinding out their ex- existence in the horrific world of Warhammer. Is, is that something yeah. you were trying to try and capture then in Imperium Maledictum? Like, what what is an average person's day like in the really, really bad universe? <laughs> well, it's pretty bad. <laughs> um, so, I mean, an average person's day is made up of a lot like toil and worship and just enough food and just enough rest so that you can toil efficiently the following <laughs> day. Um, that's, that's broadly it. But in, in terms of character creation, um, like the types of characters you can make are quite broad and we, we, we haven't tied it down to um, careers exactly as you'd be familiar with from world fantasy role play. Um, so every character is made up of an origin, a faction, and then a role. So your origin is like where you come from, you know, what, what, because there's not a lot of upward mobility, generally speaking, in the <laughs> not a lot of social mobility. So your your origin is like, oh, you were born on an agri world, you were born on, a, you know, on a forge world, or maybe you're void born, like you're born on one of the ships that travel between the Imperium, which are are so vast that they have populations aboard them, uh, you know, that just yeah. have never left the ship, sort of thing. Um, so th- that's your origin, and that decides some of your like sort of starting characteristic bonuses and skills and so on that you would have. Um, and then you choose your faction, which is probably so there's a table that's kind of weighted to make sense of where you're from so if you are from a forge world the faction that sort of you worked for your your toil contributed to was probably the uh depths of mechanicus mm-hmm. but you know you have chances of maybe you were in the astra militarum who you know they gather a tithe of people from almost every world um so your faction is you know your vocation what you were doing before um your patron found you and that decides again a bunch of talents some starting equipment more characteristics and skills that you get and then your final thing you choose is your role and your role is the thing your patron wants you to do so we have a suggestion in there which is the gm can say well as your patron i think you're a warrior i think you're an interlocutor which is you know you talk to people and or you can choose for yourself of course and that gives you your last little selection of uh, equipment skills and stats and so on and so with the combination of the three of those you get a character that um, can be quite like focused on doing just one thing or can be a little more rounded um, and you know you can explain that with in terms of what they've been doing and how their their life has gone um, but with that you should be able to create a character that fits into um, a lot of the roles so with some of the roles you might see on the tabletop you know like an astromilitarum trooper mm. or even a, even a low-ranking officer or a sort of a, a low-ranking tech priest or skatari or something like that um, but also within you know the, the areas that aren't always covered on the in the, in the war game, so there haven't been a lot of models of administratum adepts. Um, yeah, but yeah. obviously, you know, if you want to navigate the bureaucracy of the administratum, it can be helpful to have an adept with you who knows which forms to fill out and what sort of blood to use in the ink and so on. <laughs> have we got a have we got an equivalent to the rat catcher? Then is there a uh, underdog class that uh, you quite like? Um, it's probably the recidivists. So um, a recidivist is somebody is that's the faction which is really just all of the criminals and outsiders, right? Sort of fill in the gaps of imperial society, um, and they get a few nice, tasty little talents that make them good at navigating that kind of setting. And we have found in games that you players constantly end up saying like, "Well, we need to go to the black market here, or we need somebody who yeah. can talk to the gangs because you run up against the bureaucracy, or there's questions about." You know, corruption is everywhere, um, so we might as well be corrupt as well and go, let's talk to the local gangs and see who can get us into this place. Um, right. So it's always handy to have a recidivist on hand who knows knows the lingo and doesn't, you know, reek of um, the uh, an enforcers or reek of authority, you know. Yeah, no, that's that's really cool. So, so I, I like those guys. <laughs> in um in games of Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, it can be quite brutal at times. You know, in Soulbound, you're you start off as a, a mighty hero. I'm guessing the Imperial Maledictum is probably gonna be similar to fantasy roleplay in that uh things are dangerous, you may die lots. Yeah, it's it's arguably a little worse than World Fantasy Roleplay. <laughs> well, no one ever pointed a plasma gun at you. This is true, there. this is true. Um the yeah, so we've we've tweaked the system a little bit and it is pretty harsh. So um, critical hits, first of all, um, aren't completely random. They're based on how much damage you've taken. Um, put, you know, how much damage you've taken that would push you past zero wounds. So mm. you can still get crits just from a, a critical roll from your enemy. Um, but the most common way to get crits is when you run out of wounds. Um, so once your hit points, your wounds get to zero, you can keep fighting. But at that point, every injury you take 
is going to be a role on the critical hit table. And um, we, we have moved the instant deaths to the point where if you just take like one or two points of damage, you can't roll a, an instant death, thankfully. Mm, okay. But once you're taking seven, eight, nine, ten points of damage, um, you know, the chance of death becomes quite high. So, I mean, the thing we found in playtesting was like, once you're on zero wounds, consider lying down, consider not being <laughs> in this fight anymore because, you know, withdraw from this because you're you're so, you're very vulnerable. Um, and we've removed uh, something that was in Woofer, which was you could uh, do critical hit deflection. You could sacrifice a bit of armor to avoid mm. a critical hit. Um, but the armor is doing its job of reducing wounds. So that's, and that's all it does for you. Uh, you know, with the exception of things like power armor that actually give you a bit of a strength boost. Um, so it, it's fairly lethal uh, as a game. So do be careful. Um, everyone does start with some fake points, which give them a little bit of a get out of jail free card on those first couple of uh, mistakes. But once you start spending those, you don't really get them back. And, you know, that's, that starts to loom. It's, it's always very close by in um, the Imperium. So do be careful. <laughs> And I apologize to all the people who are going to lose beloved characters in Imperial Maledictum. <laughs> I guess with, with that, we've got a similar kind of like corruption mechanic. So in fantasy roleplay, I always kind of play as a hedge witch or something. And the rapid descent into madness and uh, chaos. We do. And we've tried to be explicit about how much corruption you get from certain mm. things. So like seeing a demon versus touching a demon versus listening to a demon. Okay. Um, but also um, we've kind of touched on like how you can get rid of that, um, which wasn't as much there in you know so there's ways to get rid of corruption other than just giving in and having a mutation either mental or physical you know you can make your penances to the emperor or um you know beseech the omni side of her you know to purge the, your weak flesh uh in in a kind of between adventures sort of thing mm. which which doesn't mean it's okay to go you know bathing in um nerdlich sort of filth <laughs> but uh, it does give you a bit of an option to try and get rid of that because you know, we have found that once you get one or two mutations, it, it, it can be tough. You're either lopping that limb off and looking for an augmetic or you're no longer very playable, uh, depending on what they are. Yeah. So, yeah, they're still there and you do need to take care. And, I mean, if you're a recidivist or something like that, or in certain games, you could get away with it for a while. Mm. Um, but corruption is, is very present and a, and a problem. And, of course, psychers are more open to it than anybody. Yeah, I, I imagine. Probably not a good idea going dabbling into the warp, is it? Um, so Rarely. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, with the Cubicle 7 release, have had substantial kind of supplement support. I take it that's something you're looking to do with Imperium Maledictum going forward, then? Yeah, we've planned it out fairly heavily. Um, so, uh, the initial release is going to be a, a chunky rulebook, which is going to be in a 352 pages, which is mm -hmm. around our kind of standard big, heavy rulebook. Um, yeah. We're doing a starter set. Uh, which is sound the high world of Vol, um, which is a uh, sort of processes and extracts chemicals from the Imperium. Um, and it's just as caustic and horrible as <laughs> you think that might be. Um, and that, that should be a really good entry point to people who want to play um, I Am. That's going to come with like pre generated characters and, and pre generated patrons. Um, okay. Something we didn't touch on was that like one of the things you do is create your patron. That's certainly an option for groups, um, which we found really fun. Um, but then after that, we're also going to have a GM screen, which is kind of the initial the bundle that should all be out kind of Q1-ish this year. Okay. Um, but then after that, we're going to be um, looking at specific factions and building up on them. And I, I think I'm just shy of being able to announce one. But I mean, you were talking about older games before, and there's certainly some factions that were explored in depth or that got their whole own game that we think people should have you know, the option to play as. So the first um, supplement should be a two book um, sort of slip case for one of those factions that people I think are going to really enjoy, basically. Um, it should be a good nostalgia trip for folks as well. Uh, and the two books are sort of a player's guide and a GM's guide to that faction. Within the same set? Within the same set, yeah. And they'll be out around the same time. I think the player's guide will probably be out a little sooner, but not, you know, talking a matter of weeks. Um, yeah, and so you can buy both books separately, standard edition, or you can get like a collector's edition slipcase that has both. Oh, nice! Uh, cool. in it. Awesome. So obviously, one of the, the I guess probably the most popular releases has been the uh, Enemy Within series for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Have you got plans yeah. for a big kind of sprawling campaign for uh, Imperium Maledictum then too? I, yes. <laughs> Basically, that's <laughs> like how, how should I equivocate? Um, yeah, we'd love to do that. I love The Enemy Within. It was the first project I worked on for uh, Cubicle 7 uh, on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. So, you know, I I, I love it. It was, uh, I loved playing it before ever I was in the industry. 
um, you know, and, and I think we did. A, I, I feel we did a really good job on parts four and five, um, mm. you know, which were, were kind of new, basically. Um, five was a, a rework of the previous end of the end of the and, and four was the horned rat, which was totally new based on, on ideas Graham had originally had um, uh, back in the day. And But uh, the, I mean, Imperium Maledictum, I think is calling out, calling out for something um, similar. I don't know if I would do again willingly a five book series that also comes with five companions so like a 10 book <laughs> thing to get a campaign done i think that's a lot and more suitable for something like a collector's edition of a beloved campaign so i, I think we would start with um maybe something like a three book campaign yeah. but we, we'll 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 see how that goes we have we have an approved notion an idea that um sort of dips into the history of the macarian sector a little bit and that would be really i would love to develop that so exciting. i think I... we should get to I guess I, I, you guys are quite close with Games Workshop, aren't you? So I guess you've got the advantage of uh, all their input as well, I guess. Yeah, we've been really lucky um, with them. So I, I think everyone who works as a licensee for Games Workshop, you know, there's a there's a, a sort of a licensing department there that we work really closely with, and that's full of like really knowledgeable, enthusiastic people. Because it sounds like oh, it's the licensing department, and you think it's a bunch of um, you know, sort of pencil pusher types, but I haven't met anyone like that in Games Workshop. Everyone's, kind of, you know, the first thing you talk about is like which armies you collected and so on. And um, so really, really enthusiastic, great people there. But with IM, we've also had the benefit of getting like a lot of direct input from the studio, which has just been brilliant. So um, we're delighted with that uh, and looking forward to developing, you know, building more on the strength mm. of that. Amazing. Cool. So if there's, what's the one thing you're most excited about in Imperium Maledictum? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, oh, I really did. Okay, the thing that's in it that I love is the patron system and possibly the psychic power system. Mm -hmm. um, so the patron system is you... So basically, if you want to have an adventure in War of Fantasy Roleplay, you can have five people meet in a pub and decide to go on an adventure completely plausibly. You know, like they've lost everything. You might as well make some money. Head into the Grey Mountains and see what happens. You know, and it's a, it's a game. And um, that's harder in, in War of 40,000 because, yeah. you know, the Imperium is always on the brink of absolute destruction, maybe at its own hands, um, just through like bureaucratic <laughs> nightmares. So the, the constant participation and toil of all of its citizens is essentially a necessity. So it's very difficult to get out of, you know, there is, if you meet at some weird lower hive sort of venue that produces alcohol based on industrial runoff, you know, you can sit there and think about having an adventure, but you know, it's it's difficult to pull people from many different parts of life and then to give them the capacity to ever leave their own world then is, is a whole other story. Um, which is why I think games uh, have often focused on like, oh, you're in the Inquisition and Inquisitor does something with you, or oh, you are working for a rogue trader and they're bringing you out of this life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we see those people as sort of patrons and we wanted to expand what that could be. So in the base game, you can produce a patron who's from like, I think it's any of nine factions. So like, a recidivist patron would be someone like a gang lord, basically, um, you know, who's, and that'll give you a certain type of game, very Warhammer crime inspired. You could have someone, the Inquisition are there, the Adeptus Mechanicus are there, um, and you can make like a very powerful tech priest who pulls in a bunch of people to do things for him, you know, organic components that can serve the machine god um, and go and, serve, you know, by serving them. Uh, and they pluck you out of your uh, sort of world and give you things to do. Um, so we wanted player buy-in to create that person because otherwise it's just the GM ordering you around a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, so that patron creation system lets you sort of pick abilities, boons for your patron, like things they have access to. Um, and for each one you pick, the GM uh, secretly picks a liability. So that's like something they've got enemies or they're not who they say okay, they are. Or, okay. you know, they demand certain things. Like, you know, you show back up at an injury, a paper cut, and the tech priest is like, ah, oh, well, you know what we do now? Augmetic hand. And <laughs> just, that's the only cure for that. Uh, you know, like they just load, they just are constantly tweaking you. Like you really are just a component. So, you know, we, I, I love the patron system. Um, mm. You know, I do think that some GMs are going to be not afraid of it, but nervous about giving up that level of control. And that's fine. You know, if you want to make, uh, if you want to pick your patrons, uh, the GM wants to pick the patrons, you know, who they are and where they are that's fine and let the players just pick the boons. But um, we've had really great games come out of like letting the players do everything and then kind of thinking, well, I had this adventure in mind. Why did the administratum care about a potential gene stealer cult? And you start thinking like, oh, they're siphoning off resources or they're, they're some kind of statistical anomaly that's, you know, messing with everything. And that, that gets interesting and it keeps you on your toes. So I love the patron system. 
Uh, and I quite like the psychic power system. Uh, we we adapted heavily based from Warfrup. So in, in Warfrup, you spent a long time sort of channeling power and then releasing it, which is cool. But it did mean that you had to plan a couple of turns in advance, which was hard, yeah. how dynamic combo was. Um, but in, in um, Imperial Maledictum, you sort of do the power with the appropriate roles and chances of failure and perils of the warp and all that. But you do the thing, and then you, based on the power you used, you gain an amount of warp charge. And depending on your sort of willpower and whether you're like a sanctioned psyker or not, you have a, a, a threshold for how much warp charge you can sort of safely hang on to. And once you go past that, you start dealing with consequences. Okay. So, uh, and you, you can get rid of that. You can um, do this thing called purgation, where you sort of, you know, deal with that charge that's building up and find non-destructive ways to get rid of it. So, but I like that we sort of flipped the the way it works. So you, you start by doing the thing you wanted to do, and then you have a couple of turns to deal with the consequences, as opposed to a couple of turns of doing nothing and then releasing the power. Um, it does mean psychics are quite powerful, um, but it also means that they can they can easily push it too far um you know and then it's up to their buddies to kind of recognize when that happens and uh, yeah you know administer the emperor's grace to them and that's fitting for the universe isn't it you know I, i'm sure your patron wouldn't be too keen on uh them dabbling too deeply into their psychic powers and uh maybe he has a slight mm -hmm. nod to want to you know keep an eye on this member of the party doesn't quite trust him oh definitely um but you know you could be from the um adeptus astra telepathica your patron could be uh you know a very powerful sister of silence who has yeah, tasks that a sister of silence can't do for you know, many reasons. Mm. Um, so you you could be um, you, you could be a party of like a couple of psychers and their handlers looking oh, for nice. rogue psychers in the hive or people who've escaped the black ships or something. So yeah, there's there's a, a lot of room to play with there. That's really cool. So do you play Warhammer Forty Thousand yourself? And you know, if you do, what army do you play? So I used to play a, a quite a bit of 40k, and I played like tons of Blood Angels. Basically, was what I, I played and collected, um, and I still occasionally find unpainted boxes of them here and there. Um, but I, since uh, sort of, I got very heavily into role playing games in my twenties, and rather than playing like full on um, war games, I ended up playing a lot of skirmish games. Hmm. So um, Mordheim, Necromunda, and uh, most recently Kill Team, and I actually picked up. Um, Beast Grave recently, some of the warmer oh, nice. underworld stuff, um, to try my wife because uh, she she oh. likes board games and that feels like a good middle ground because there's a board. So I'm going to see how that goes. <laughs> um, but yeah, collected Blood Angels and I've always had a soft spot for the Imperial Guard, the Astro Militarum as well. Um, my buddy John from secondary school collected a lot of those and I, I always love the tanks. So some you know sometimes I have a weakness and just buy one model and then <laughs> see how it goes. It always starts at one model, though, doesn't it? And then escalates rapidly. It does. But I mean, that's the thing. Like, I think I've I've now got, like, Necr Necrons, uh, Imperial Guard, um, Space Marines, obviously, and um, and Orc Kill Team. And then, you know, someone gave me a painted Orc or a Grosh tank for uh, my birthday last year. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, you see, with the Kill Team and the tank, I'm kind of on the way to an army. It's there not that go. much more. You know, a couple of battle, battle force or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we'll we'll see till I get back into. But I, I think um, skirmish games suit me more. And I like the kind of narrative. I feel like yeah. you get a stronger narrative around a handful of um, soldiers. So I quite like that. You know, they're all named anytime I do them, even when the rules don't really require it. It's it's hard. It's gonna be to. done. Rule the cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to know who just got their face melted by uh, a plasma or melted now. You know, no, who's, who, whose name do I scream out? Um, but yeah, so that's. It's a lot of my hobby side. Awesome, that's really cool. So, is there a particular part of the Warhammer Forty Thousand universe you'd like to explore in the future in Imperium Maledictum? Um, do you mean like a physical location, yeah, either, either or a location, a, like or, or a race, or I don't know, a, a theme? Ooh, I thought that's loads of things. So, the Macarian <laughs> sector, obviously, I think we want to build upon really strongly because we've kind of gotten it as um, a bit of a sandbox, though. Obviously, it remains part of like you know games workshops thing and they have stuff planned for it as well i'm sure and um but i'd love to expand on that a little bit more mm. um but i mean in terms of things i'd like to do at im um an adeptus mechanicus faction supplement would be great um i think for a role-playing game because like they've been so tech priests show up in almost all the role-playing games and they tend to be the tech person that follows the group around to some degree and does tech stuff and you know explains what the 
crazy runes we're in or like oh these are probably necron this is all nosilish whatever you know this you know they, they're there to interpret all that and make the machines work and so on keep the machine spirits happy but i'd love to do a game that's just completely focused on them so you get a faction supplement um that lets you play games with just maybe just set on a forge world or as part of an explorator feat and everybody is some flavor of adeptus mechanicus um mm -hmm. person you know maybe a, a tech priest and they're sort of cadre of like a, a maniple of Skitari and you know one or two other uh people taken from different areas in the faction or you know explore the various electro police sort of schisms in a role-playing yeah. game would be good i think just loads of fodder there uh, and you're kind of playing that sort of indiana jones style exploring you know tomb raider style stuff as well in a sense because yeah. you know, you're going down into places and um you know i i think there's a sort of just a sort of a Sometimes there's a, a, a thing where it's like, oh, if you go and explore a rune, a, a rune of some kind, it's always like it's Eldari or it's Necron or it's whatever, or, you know, Dark Age of Technology, maybe. That's who it can be. But like the War of 40,000 universe, the galaxy is vast. Mm -hmm. There's been endless Xenos, you know, who have been and existed and passed from existence, whether they, you know, just their species was destroyed at some point or they just faded from the, the galaxy, who've left beside all, all, all kinds of crazy, crazy stuff. Um, <laughs> that you 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 could find as a as a party and have no idea what any of it's gonna do. You know, it's not gonna summon Necrons. It's gonna do something really horrible. You're gonna get teleported halfway across the galaxy or, you know, you're gonna end up in a, in a piece of the webway that the species had access to or, you know, I, I just think it'd be great. You could go mess around in tombs finding all sorts of crazy stuff um and dealing with the consequences. I think it'd be very fun. There's going to be the fun part in that campaign where the, the player finds out that the, the weapon that could end the entire universe has just been casually thrown into the backpack as well. Yeah, it's just been there the whole time. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it's some kind of star devourer or weird shard of Catan or something that they've they've picked up. Yeah, that, that would be fun. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> so, yeah, so you said earlier that we planned release date Q1 then this year. Have we got, is that for the initial yeah. kind of the book um, starter set and the GM screen then? Well, yeah, so the, the first release will be pro pro quite soon, probably in the next few weeks, we should have the um, core rulebook out. Awesome. Um, so that'll be up uh, for pre-order. When you pre-order, you'll get the PDF. Um, and then, uh, depending on logistics and everything else, we will hopefully have that in stores in the summer. Mm. Um, then we should have the starter set, um, I think probably the GM screen um, first, I would say, um, then the starter set. Uh, in, in later in Q1, it'll be the same story, a pre-order where you get the PDF um, straight away. And then I think we're also doing a short free adventure um, that sort of ties into the starter set world. That will be, it'll be out when it's out and is free PDF and uh, it's there to get everybody started. Um, and we will try and get a couple more supporting items, like a few pre-generated um, patrons and so on out in some format, uh, maybe a PDF only uh, early in Q1 as well, just to help get people uh, rolling sort of straight away amazing um yeah and then later in the year we have uh, hopefully that big faction book uh the, the two book set should be later in the year as well um and maybe one more you know we're 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 aiming to support uh, i am pretty strongly so we we're eyeing up a, a nice bestiary and an armory as well oh, awesome that'd be really cool well i look forward to it well thanks again for joining us before we let you go though we've got a super important question to ask you What's your favorite sprue and what's your favorite brew? Well, so the sprue changes and it's often the last thing I build. <laughs> um, but I, I've had this for what? I actually had it on hand, which is the uh, Venerable Dreadnought. Amazing. It's where you see my terrible Xenothal highlighting. <laughs> it's my, my, my secret is I'm not very good at painting, uh, but um, I, I love those Dreadnoughts and I know there's newer Dreadnoughts and there's bigger Dreadnoughts and everything else, but it's just, it's, it's so great. Um, you know, I, I've, I've fond memories of both like playing Dreadnoughts and also having them in sort of like Dawn of War and mm. especially the co-op. And they just felt so impactful and stompy in class that I love the old Dreadnought, um, the boxy Dreadnoughts. They're great. They're very iconic, uh, aren't they? They're so good. Yeah. And, <laughs> I, and I don't know, I couldn't tell you what it is about them exactly, but I just, they just really sell the walking sarcophagus yeah. sort of you know, risen again to fight for the Emperor sort of vibe that I think is class. <laughs> um, whereas a lot of the, the, the newer ones are so cool. Um, but, you know, nostalgia is a big factor here. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, and my favourite brew, this is, uh, yeah, I've, I just, this is going to be the most controversial answer. So, like, 
you know, I have kids and, uh, you know, things to do and I'm, I'm a busy guy. Um, and I don't, I find that like, you know, having, having a couple of beers is, is more sometimes an inconvenience these days, but I've grown <laughs> quite fond of Guinness Zero, non-alcoholic Guinness. Zero. Guinness. I know it's terrible, but, um, I, I quite like it. I know it's a you know, massive corporation. It's not a cool indie brew, but <laughs> like when you have to drive home, it's great. <laughs> Just go out and have one and have a chat. No, that's cool. Yeah. Thanks again for joining us, Padraig. It's been really, really good to have you on. We're really looking forward to checking out Imperium Maledictum. So I'm sure we'll be sharing some more uh, news and previews as we get closer to it. Um, for anyone who does want to check out more, are you doing a couple of shows this year? We definitely are. Um, and this is the point where you probably expect me to tell you what those ones are. Uh, and I'm not certain. Um, <laughs> I, I think we're probably going to do um, Warmer Fest and we're probably doing Gen Con and we're probably doing a bunch of other ones that I can't remember off the top of my head. So I would suggest people go and check out the website <laughs> um, where Fiona and Neil and Marketing will have actual information as opposed to my hearsay. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thanks again for joining us and I'm sure we'll speak to you real soon. Uh, thank you again for having me. Absolute pleasure. Anytime. Cheers. Cheers.